Hello everyone and welcome to this new lecture. I'm super excited because in this lecture we're going to cover an, 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 an I'm super excited because in this lecture we're going to cover an amazing type of recurrent neural network known as the long short term term memory or LSTM networks for short. So let's get started. So first, LSTM networks work better compared to the vanilla recurrent neural networks since simply they overcome the vanishing gradient problem. If you guys remember from the previous lectures is that recurrent neural networks, yes, in theory, they can work great. Unfortunately, when you use them in practice, they actually perform very, very poorly. And the reason for that is because of the vanishing gradient problem, which is, if you guys recall, because as we propagate the error back through all these multiple layers of the recurrent neural network, we'll find that the network performance will, will, will be very, very poor during training because our gradient becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And let's actually, like, let's go back to a little bit of the math that I discussed previously. So if you guys remember, if my gradient is very, very small, you know, like 0 0.001, for example, resulting of, because we multiplied, let's say, very small, you know, like um, gradient point 0.1 using the chain rule by another point 0.1, by another point 0.1 going back through all the layers of the, of the network, we will find that basically the gradient will be very small. So when we update the weights by using the old weight plus or minus learning rate times my gradient, my new weight will be very, very will be basically almost equal to my old weight. So, so basically the network weights will not gonna update at all. It will take you forever to update. And that's one of the major challenges of the recurrent neural networks is the vanishing gradient problem. Long story short, now we have a solution for it. And one of these solutions is the LSTM network or, or um, long short-term memory networks. So here is a reference, really good reference for you guys for regarding LSTM. I actually have it open here and there's a ton of information. Um, so if you guys can see here, that's the blog post and it's actually published in 2015 and it's published by Kola. It's actually very, very interesting. And you will find here there is, you know, explanation of the basic recurrent neural networks. Why do we use it and how we're going to overcome that by applying LSTM or long short term memory networks. All right. Okay. So here is the blog again for you guys, but I'm going to walk you through basically the solution uh, overall right now. So let's get started. So let's assume that we have, uh, we train a recurrent neural networks to perform, let's say, um, text translation. So in order for the recurrent neural networks to perform text translation, it needs to know basically the Let's assume that we want to train a recurrent neural networks to try to perform text sequencing. Like for example, let's assume that I wanted to provide this, this sentence, the tree color is, and I want to predict what's the next word we're going to look like, which is in this case, for example, should be green. So as you guys can see here, the recurrent neural network, if you train a vanilla, just a basic RNN, the network will actually going to perform well in this case. Since the gap between the prediction, which is my green word, and the necessary context, which is basically the word tree, that's the context that the recurrent neural network needs, then the gap between the two is very, very small. And that's why the network will be able to perform well. And a recurrent neural network, just a vanilla one, should work great in this example. However, if you take a look at another example, which is, let's say, this text, I live in Quebec, in Northern Canada, where I live, the weather is generally, and now I'm looking for this word most of the year, okay? So as you guys can see here, the recurrent neural network here in this case will perform poorly. Why? Because the gap between my prediction, which is the word cold that I'm looking up here, it needs context, but the problem is it needs context b basically far back back away just you know like it's it's really early in the context here i need to know the quebec so the distance between quebec and the word cold is much much longer compared to let's say green and the word tree and that's why you will find that here the performance of the network of a basic vanilla recurrent neural network will degrade poorly and that's and that's a big issue and that's why we're going to introduce lstm all right 
So LSTM networks are type of recurrent neural networks that are designed to remember long-term dependencies by default. LSTM can remember and recall information for a prolonged period of time, and that's why it could basically simply overcome the issues of the basic recurrent neural networks. So if you guys remember, that's my basic vanilla recurrent neural networks. Basically, here I have my input. I have my um, history that's coming from my previous time step, xt minus 1. And what I do is I apply the hyperbolic tangent function to generate my new output, basically, or my new state. And that's pretty much our basic or vanilla recurrent neural networks. So LSTM simply overcome this issue by saying, you know what? Let's take whatever history we have and keep it all along. Just make it, force it to go throughout all the time steps. Again, it's a very simple solution, but actually that's what happened in practice. So an LSTM network or long short term memory, the most important characteristic here in the LSTM that you will find that here, this line, is basically that's what solve all my issues. That's basically the you know like a PhD thesis right there, just to try to like fix the issues of recurrent or vanilla recurrent neural networks. And as you guys can see here, this line here is basically what we call the horizontal line. It's called the memory or what we call it the cell state. And this cell state enables my long short term memory to remember very old information. Now I basically have all the memory that I had in the past, everything that happened, you know, let's say in the context, if you go back here, I have, I know that there is Quebec, I know that there is Canada in there, I know all everything in the past. And that's why LSTM networks will be able to overcome the issues of my vanilla or basic recurrent neural networks. All right, so the first qu next question is, okay, what the hell is happening here? Like, obviously here it's a lot more complicated compared to this one. What's happening here? What are these sigmas? You know, what are these like gates? You know, what are these multiplications? It looks very, very complex. However, it's actually very, very simple and very, very intuitive. So let's jump right into it. All right. So simply, that's my LSTM basically cell. That's just one cell of a long short term memory network. And again, thanks for the uh, here, this um, um, blog post by call that's actually very, very intuitive and the photos are amazing. So you'll find that the LSTM contains gates that can allow or block information from passing by. And these gates simply consist of what we call it the sigmoid neural net layer, along with a pointwise multiplication layer. Simply put, you will find here that there is our sigmoid here. This basically referred to a sigmoid activation function. And whenever you find the sigmoid, you will find that there is multiplication afterwards or a pointwise multiplication. So this is one branch. All right. It's kind of think of it as kind of a gate. OK, it simply allows or blocks information from passing by. That's all what it is. Again, you will find that here I have again another sigmoid followed by another pointwise multiplication. Again, another sigmoid followed by another again pointwise multiplication. And as you guys can see here, I basically have two outputs that could come out of my sigmoid, which is simply zero or one. Zero indicates I don't wanna allow any data to flow. And one means I wanna allow all, everything to flow, all the data to flow. All right, so if you guys have, you know, a little bit, uh, if, you're, if you guys are a little bit familiar with, let's say fluid dynamics or just basic hydraulics, you will find that this is simply a valve, okay? So this valve can, if you guys can see here, if you rotate this, if you rotate that blue, let me zoom in. So if you rotate that blue, um, basically wheel in there, you will find that you can open the valve or close the valve. It's like allowing water to flow or blocking the water from flowing. That's all what it is. And that's exactly what's happening here mathematically. Okay. So this sigmoid can, I can tune it or tweak it to either allow data to flow here or block the data. In the same fashion, I can change or attune the sigmoid here to basically allow data to flow here or block data from flowing. Again, the same thing here. I can use my sigmoid along with pointwise multiplication to allow data to flow or block the data completely. That's all what it is. So let's take a look at some naming conventions. So first, simply in, in, in LSTM, I have three gates or three valves. Okay. Again, in a nutshell, I wanted to control three information or three flow of information. 
I want to control my memory. I want to know how much information do I need to, to remember, basically, from the past. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Second thing, I need to know how, what is the amount of information that I need to get from my input. Okay, and I need to know how much information do I need to generate as an output. That's all what it is. And that's why I have three, basically, gates. The first one is the forget gate. Again, this gate allows me to remember or forget stuff from the past. That's my past, CT minus one, and it's pa passing by. I can here say I need nothing from the, my past. So here I will send zero that will block all the information. Or I can set one or pass one, which is simply one multiplied by whatever it is basically whatever. So one multiplied by CT minus one that will allow CT minus one to pass, which means now I can basically enable or allow all them, all my information, all my historical information to, pa to pass by. So now I can control the amount of information that I had from the past. That's one of them. The second gate is what we call the input gate. Again, pretty simple. Here is my input, HXT. Here is my hidden state, HT minus one from the past. And if you guys recall, I had to apply the hyperbolic tangent to both of them. And it will generate here, that will be my input. And now I have basically the power to control how much input do I need to pass by? Do I need to allow it all or do I need to block it all? Again, numbers that can range from zero to one. Again, think of this as again, a valve or a gate. Think of this as a, a valve or a gate. That's all what it is. And the last one, which is again, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now I have again, an output gate, which is simply here, my sigmoid along with my multiplication. This controls the amount of output that I'll be generating here. Okay, so here I will take my memory, which is my CT. I'm gonna apply my hyperbolic tangent to it. And that should be my output that will be fed to my next state, if you guys remember. So now I can control the amount of information that I can pass by to the output. Okay, and that's the beauty of it. Now I basically like, you know, it's like, a, like having, you know, like, like full automatic control system that I can control the valve, you know, control three valves. I can enable information from the past. I can control the information from the input and I can control information from the output as well. All right, okay. If you guys are a little bit confused, don't worry about it. In the next slide, I'm gonna walk you through all the mathematics and that should clarify everything. So first here I have a variable called FT and FT is basically coming from the from this mathematical operation. Okay, so let's take a look at it. So the first one is FT. Simply, I'm gonna here. I have my input XT, which is here. I have my HT minus one, which is this state here. And what I could do is I can take these two inputs, concatenate them together, and I'm going to apply basically a neural net application, just a neural basic neural net. I'm gonna take that, multiply by the weight, which is captured here somewhere. And then I'm gonna apply a bias signal. Okay, so again, this layer, this block or yellow block is a simple neural net. And this is the equation of a basic neural net. I have my input multiplied by the weights. I'm gonna add a bias signal. And then I'm gonna apply my sigmoid activation function. And that will generate my first control valve. That's the first control signal. Okay, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at another one. Let's take a look at IT. Okay, and what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna let you guys, uh, what I want you guys to do is to please go ahead. I want you to pause the video and I want you to just write the equation down of IT, okay? Again, it looks very similar to FT, so you guys should be able to figure it out. Please give it a shot. Please go ahead, pause the video, and I will see you guys after the challenge. All right, I hope you guys were able to figure out the challenge. What I ask you guys to do is to simply plot this equation or just draw this equation. So here IT here is simply coming from the HT minus one, which is again coming from the past. I have again another input XT and then multiply a new set of weights. We call them weight I. Okay, again, because this is a, an independent artificial neural network. And then I will add B bias I and then apply a sigmoid activation function and then that will generate my next control gate. That will be my next kind of, you know, valve, which is IT. All right, looks great. Let's go ahead and do another one. Let's go ahead and see what's ha what the hell is happening here, which is C, you know, like bar T, okay? So this one is simple as well. Here, it's again, another artificial neural network. 
that simply takes ht minus 1, takes my xt, okay? And then I'm going to multiply by wc, by weight c, and then add a bias signal, another bias signal. Again, this is a neural net, exactly the same as this, exactly the same as this. But here, I'm going to apply a hyperbolic tangent instead. So that's why I have 10, 10 h here instead. It stands for hyperbolic tangent. And that should generate my ct, basically, bar here. All right? Okay, so now I have three outputs. Now I calculated my ft, I calculated my it, I calculated my ct bar here. The question is, how can I mix them together? How can I come up with a new equation to basically leverage all that information? So let's take a look at it. So here is my equation. This equation simply says my CT, which is my output here, will be equals to basically the summation of two things. Now I have summation. That's why I have summation here. And I have two sources of information. One of them is coming from here is ct times it right so that's ct bar times it and that would be the first one here correct and then i have another source of information again this is basic summation right so summation before the summation i have another source of information which is simply ct minus one which is my past here multiplied by ft which is again coming from here so basically i have two sources of information to my addition which is one here and another one here, and that's all what it is. The question is, what are these parameters? So first, ct bar is coming from this equation. So ct bar came from this equation, which is what we draw it before. And I have my two valves here, which is ft and it are coming here from these two equations. Beautiful, right? It's again, pretty, pretty incredible. Everything comes into play nicely, and now we have basically a new output ct. The last one, which is my output, here, OT, my simply my OT will be equals to, again, I have another sigmoid, which is again, another gate, exactly the same as before. We multiply the weights, weight O, multiply by HT minus one and XT, we add a bias signal, and that will generate my output OT. And then afterwards, we take my output, okay? We multiply it by CT times, or we apply first, my apologies, not times, we apply the hyperbolic tangent activation function to my output CT here, and then we simply multiply that because a point-wise multiplication, we multiply it by OT, which is simply my output gate, and that should generate my HT, which is, could be fed to my next memory cell. And that's it. And that's basically the um, six equations that could describe the LSTM network in nutshell. Luckily, we are not gonna rely on any of that. Actually, we're not gonna decode it at all. We're going to show you how we can use Keras API and we're going to use TensorFlow 2.0 to simply call LSTM network and just go there and we're going to be able to program it very, very easily. And that's all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, I know there was a lot of information, a lot of mathematics, but I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you guys, uh, please stay tuned. And in the next lecture, I'm going to walk you through from the project that we're going to build an LSTM network from scratch. Please stay tuned, best of luck, and please enjoy TensorFlow 2.0 Practical Advanced, and I will see you guys in the next lecture.